Jonah had a lot of problems. Aside from his proclivity to act emotional at any given chance, he had a much deeper problem. He didn't want God's adversaries to be saved. It doesn't get any worse than the Assyrians. They flayed individuals alive and engaged in some of the most heinous torture tactics documented in history. Jonah saw the northern kingdom of Israel fall to them and be captured or scattered. So imagine his rage when God instructed him to deliver a cautionary message to them. Although the message claimed God would destroy Nineveh, a great city in Assyria, Jonah understood there was a catch. God would relent if the people repented. Jonah chapter 4 But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So he purposely fled to postpone the word from reaching them so they'd face judgment. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 through 6. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your god. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And this sounds awful to us. How could Jonah, a god-fearing man, wish destruction on anyone? But if we're completely honest with ourselves, we can think of a few Ninevites in our lives that we'd prefer to see reap the benefits of the havoc they'd created in the past. Perhaps we don't go that far. However, when given the opportunity to bear testimony to them, we can retort, Bah! They've caused me far too much pain. I suppose I'll delegate this one to another Christian. Jonah finally obeyed God, and it proved to be a success. Jonah chapter 3 Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. However, Jonah was not happy with their redemption. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. 
And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So, let us look at some prospective Ninevites in our lives and how we might forgive them and offer them the example of Jesus. Why did Jonah want to see the Ninevites burn? Apart from the fact that the Assyrians had wreaked havoc on Israel a few decades before the events of the book of Jonah, it also boils down to a matter of national pride. When Jonah introduces himself in Jonah chapter 1, he begins with his Hebrew identification before moving on to his religious identity. In other words, his priorities had shifted. Yes, in the Old Testament, God deliberately chose the nation of Israel to be his representatives. But that didn't imply God didn't care about every nation he made. The Assyrians were among them, and if God wanted to offer them a chance to repent, he wanted to give them plenty of time to do so. Hence, why he called Jonah. But Jonah got lost in all the hurt and destruction the Ninevites caused. He concluded that God had made a mistake and that the Ninevites would receive all they deserved. Jonah had forgotten not only how many times God had relented and forgiven Israel, but also that the Lord had created everyone in his image, including those in Assyria. And, to be honest, we do the same. So, let us look at which Ninevites we may have avoided seeing in our life. Our enemies. This seems intuitive, but enemies can come in all shapes and sizes. Perhaps it's a coworker who doesn't perform all of the jobs they claim to do, and you find yourself picking up the slack. Maybe it's the family member who likes to poke fun at you during holiday parties. Perhaps it's that job that passed you over all those years ago and promoted someone who didn't deserve it. If thinking about it makes your blood boil, the individual is most likely an adversary. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. As Christians, we are aware that the Bible instructs us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. However, Many of Jesus' sayings sound fine on paper. Putting them into action feels as if it is devouring us from the inside out because it contradicts what culture teaches us to do and what our former selves would like. Nobody's salvation is worth a slight. Forgiveness does not come easily, but people can understand what love looks like via our example. Perhaps they, too, will have a heart shift. Perhaps we avoid reaching out to our families. They are frequently the most difficult persons to forgive and are on the front lines of our mission efforts. Many of us have family members who are not Christians. And because those closest to you know how to damage you the most, the most intense spiritual battle tends to take place in such near circles. We are frequently tempted to throw up the towel and delegate witnessing to cousins or parents or acquaintances or co-workers. We should be thankful that God included Jonah in the Bible's canon. If God ever painted a picture of our human nature, our proclivity to avoid responsibilities in favor of self-serving, it was via Jonah. He paints the perfect portrayal of a hesitant leader in a desperate situation. However, he is not alone. Many reluctant leaders have been called by God. Consider Moses, who in Egypt believed he could accomplish more than he actually could. God called on him only after 40 years of training when he thought he could only do so much. He displayed complete reluctance as he stood before a flaming bush, attempting to abdicate authority. Consider Gideon, whom God appointed to lead an attack on the Midianites. He debated with an angel about why he couldn't do it. Consider King Saul, who was head and shoulders above the rest. When Samuel came to anoint him king of Israel, he hid behind the bags. Consider Jeremiah, whom God designated as a prophet to the nations. This young man debated with God on the basis of his tender age, as though God had forgotten how old he was. God basically responded, I have been preparing you since before you took shape in your mother's womb. Jonah's hesitation did not take the shape of an argument. Instead, he simply went away. He objected to his summons not because of his inability, but because of the apparent insanity of summoning Nineveh to repentance. Jonah saw this as an evil culture deserving of no warning of coming calamity. As a result, he fled. Days later, he found that even the most powerful leaders cannot outrun God. A giant fish gobbled the sputtering prophet after some terrified sailors hurled him overboard in his direction. During the next three days, in the belly of the fish, he regained perspective, and when God ordered the beast to spit him up on shore, the chastened prophet had completed the duty God had assigned him. It's worth noting that every significant character in the story, the storm, the sailors, the fish, the king, the Ninevites, the vine, the worm, and the east wind, all obey God, 
Except for Jonah, God's chosen leader, sometimes the leader must repent before calling the people to repentance. God never gave up on Jonah despite his disobedience, lack of perspective, cultural bias, self-righteousness, incorrect reasons, and terrible attitude. What is the main point? God sometimes uses us in spite of ourselves. He even employs reluctant leaders to carry out his compassionate goal. The Role of God in Jonah In this book, God takes the initiative once more. He appoints a leader who initially refuses to obey. God pursues him, summons a large fish, perhaps a whale, to swallow him, allows him to live for three days in the belly of that creature, and then orders him to spit up on shore. Only then does Jonah travel to Nineveh to speak with the people. Even after delivering his message, God is forced to take the initiative again as Jonah reacts furiously to their remorse. God grows a vine to shade him and then teaches him about kindness and grace. God must labor harder than he did for the Ninevites to get his chosen leader to be submissive. To be sub